A recent poll showed that nearly 80% of Americans think the U.S. is in decline. What? Like the whole point of the USA is that you think your kids are gonna have a better life than you. In part one of this series, I discussed why America has actually been thriving. But we can't take that for granted. So here in part two, I'll dive into some of the key risks our country faces. Contrary to popular belief, the biggest threats don't come from external factors like China or climate change or AI. They come from within. In Texas, we have a saying, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And trying to fix what isn't broken is leading to dangerous shifts in US politics that could threaten our future in three ways. The first way that America's polarized politics and negative self-image could threaten its future is through its immigration policies. Everyone's favorite topic, immigration, immigration, immigration. Most people and politicians focus a lot on how too much immigration can be a bad thing, but they fail to recognize how too little can also be a bad thing. Over the next few decades, aging populations are gonna become a bigger and bigger challenge for many countries, including the US. One of the keys that has set us apart from places like Japan over the past 30 years has been immigration, and it could also be a significant advantage over China in the next 30 years, if we let it. To illustrate this, you can see how from 1990 to 2020, the percentage of Japan's population that was over age 65 more than doubled from about 13% to 30% while the US population stayed about the same. That's actually the main reason their economy stagnated while the US continued to grow. Over the next 30 years, China's population is projected to mirror the last 30 years in Japan. Almost exactly. Japan went from 13 to 30% and China is projected to go from 13 to 32% of its population over the age of 65. Since none of the three countries have a high enough birth rate to keep the population stable, immigration has been the key reason why the US has been able to keep growing while Japan stagnated in the last 30 years. And it could help the US keep growing while China stagnates over the next 30 years, if politicians don't get in the way. Fat chance, right? Or slim chance. I've, always, I've never really understood those two phrases, fat chance, slim chance, whatever. Okay, besides taking care of the elderly and doing the jobs many Americans don't wanna do, immigrants have also been a huge source of dynamism and innovation in the US. Almost half of Fortune 500 companies were founded by immigrants or children of immigrants, including Apple, Amazon, and Costco. Immigrants have also won almost half of the Nobel Prizes in science that have been won in the US since the year 2000. Statistically, they are less likely to commit a crime and more likely to start a business than native-born Americans. Our lives would definitely not be better without them. Yet, Trump tried to place new restrictions on how many skilled, legal immigrants could come into the US, then started building a wall, and Biden has continued most of Trump's immigration policies. Border control is definitely important for every country, but when you have an aging population, not enough immigration can be just as big of a problem as too much immigration. So severely curtailing it could actually hurt our economy in the long run, more than a lot of people realize. The second way that America's polarized politics and negative self-image could threaten its future is through protectionist America first policies. These things often sound good when politicians say them, especially when they're hidden under the guise of national security or paired with nostalgia like bringing manufacturing jobs home. There's just one problem. The road to hell is paved with good intentions and protectionism has been proven for generations to do more harm than good because of all the unintended consequences it comes with. Maybe these are too complicated for politicians' tiny brains to comprehend, but I think you'll get it. Globalization and open competition have been key factors underpinning the long-term growth of the US. Take semiconductors, for example. The US used to dominate global semiconductor manufacturing, but it's lost about three quarters of its market share over the last 30 years. However, you can see from the blue line that its market share of the total semiconductor industry has actually grown since then, as US companies like Nvidia and Broadcom have captured some of the higher value parts of the supply chain, like chip design. Intel lost its edge in manufacturing to companies like Taiwan Semiconductor and Samsung, but that's okay. We've lost some manufacturing jobs, but gained even more high paying jobs in the same industry. The ability to use the most advanced chips made by a company in Taiwan with the most advanced equipment made by a company in the Netherlands that uses the most advanced lenses made by a company in Germany has allowed all kinds of American tech companies like Apple to thrive. iPhones are also not assembled in the US, by the way but there's a reason that Apple is the most valuable company in the world, not Foxconn, who puts the phones together. Manufacturing isn't everything. By value, over 80% of the global technology sector is captured by US companies. But now the government wants to spend billions of dollars of taxpayer money to win back the lower value part of the supply chain? It's actually trillions of dollars if you count the money it's spending to do the same thing with other industries like electric vehicles, batteries, and green energy production. Even if you buy the claim of national security reasons for all this protectionism on semiconductors and green technology, why do we put tariffs on washing machines? Were we afraid China wanted to make our clothes dirty? 
This is a great example of unintended consequences of protectionism. As of 2019, it was estimated that the washing machine tariffs had generated $82 million of extra revenue for the government, while increasing costs to US consumers by $1.5 billion per year. It costs American taxpayers about $815,000 per job created. Protectionism costs taxpayers money, leads to more industry lobbying, and gives companies unfair advantages that reduce their productivity and incentives to innovate. Another unintended consequence of protectionism has to do with the third way that America's polarized politics and negative self-image could threaten its future by deteriorating strategic relationships. Its recent strategy almost sounds like the opposite of Dale Carnegie's famous book, more like how to lose friends and infuriate people. After World War II, the US helped build a new world order based on global rules and free markets that led to decades of global prosperity. Then came protectionism and polarized politics. Let's start small with the oil industry. In California, they're proposing a law to cap the profits of the oil industry. In Texas, they banned financial companies from doing business if they weren't friendly enough to the oil industry. When US politicians start harming US companies for political gain, the American people and the US economy lose. Placing huge tariffs on your allies is no way to win friends either. And the trillions of dollars we're spending on protectionist state-led subsidies are exactly what we used to criticize China for doing. This is from 2010, when we accused China of illegally stimulating and protecting its producers of green technology. And this is from Biden's Inflation Reduction Act in 2022, which is designed to stimulate and protect its producers of green technology. The US throws a ton of money at bringing production here. So Europe and other allies have to spend a ton of money to bring production there. And then all the same stuff gets produced, but the people pay for it in the form of higher taxes and more expensive products. Toxic politics have also significantly harmed our relationship with our most important trading partner and largest military threat, China. Politicians' constant desire to one-up each other to show who's tougher on China is like the Democrats saying, I'm going to cut off my finger, and the Republicans saying, oh yeah? Well, I'm going to cut off my whole hand. The problem is, it's the U.S. people who end up taking the pain. American first protectionism, polarized politics, and the departure from the free market world order means that as an ally, the U.S. is simply not as reliable as it once was. We've weakened our relationship with China, our key allies like Europe and Canada, and we've even turned on ourselves in many cases. Most of these self-harming policies stem from a culture of negativity and a false narrative that the US is in decline and everyone else is to blame. China's evil, immigrants are evil, big corporations are evil, billionaires are evil, the opposite political party is evil. Instead of lifting ourselves up, we should try to bring them down. In part one of this series, I showed how the US economy is definitely not in decline but it could be if we continue down this path. In order to avoid shooting ourselves in the foot, America needs to understand that a more optimistic, positive sum approach is the best way to build a better future for all. That's been the key source of our dynamism, prosperity, and global leadership. And that's what will allow us to stay on top. People in other parts of the world are not teaching their young children to hate their own country. And if you... If you continue to do this, how is, how is the West going to do in the battle of civilization?